Postcards from Nebraska on RFD-TV, a program about rural life. This week, join Roger Welsh for a look at an invisible border that separates two very distinct Nebraska lifestyles, farmers in the east, ranchers in the west, and their unique choice of manly footwear. Think cattle rustling went away with the Old West? Think again and meet the woman who's the law in these parts, making sure every cow is in the right place. Plus, when the streets are filled with crazy looking machines and rail cars are lined up on the outskirts of town, it means only one thing in Nebraska, harvest time. And finally, after months and months of cold wind, gray skies, and piles of snow, it's time to start thinking about spring. It's all this week on Postcards from Nebraska. Somewhere out here on the open plains, there's a demarcation line. On the eastern side of that invisible line, there are farms, and here in the west, there are ranches. Over there, there's center pivot irrigation and cornfields, while here there's beef cattle and barbed wire. Over there, they wear seed caps and bib overalls. Here, they wear big hats and cowboy boots. If there's any question that cowboy boots are more than an article of clothing, all you have to do is look around. Boots are inverted over fence posts in long, impressive lines, stating clearly, son, this is ranch country. We're ranchers, not farmers. I once made the mistake of asking a guy out in this country if his place was a farm or a ranch. He looked at me with contempt and blurted out, there's not a plow on the whole damn place. It was a ranch, and he was a cowboy as I would have known if I'd have looked at his feet. If you're a cowboy in Valentine, Nebraska, in the heart of real cowboy country, or want to look like a cowboy, you're likely to find yourself looking at boots in Young's Western wear. You got people coming out here, they like the wide open spaces, they see, see the cattle grazing. Hey, the first thing they think of is, uh, it wouldn't be, it'd be kind of fun to be a cowboy. That's Mike five, Young is manager of the store. It used to be cowboys were the only ones that wore western wear. Now, you see a lot of people wearing western wear. It's a fashion. So, even I could wear cowboy boots. You could. <laughs> you got, we can fix you right up here if you'd like. There's more to buying cowboy boots than simply finding some that fit. There's lizard, an ostrich, even shark. There's buckaroos and ropers, work shoes, even cowboy tennis shoes. And then you can start worrying about color. Those will stretch a lot more than the other ones because they are the doe skin. Historically, cowboy boots evolved to fit the cowboy's job. The high tops protected his ankles from rubbing against stirrups and from rattlesnakes on those rare occasions when he found himself afoot. The high heels kept his feet firmly in the stirrups, and the pointed toes eased mounting and dismounting a cow pony. Whatever purpose they served, they certainly weren't meant for walking or dancing. Even this cord I use is different from a normal cowboy boot. I milked beeswax and tree walk rosin into it. It keeps it from rotting out from the cow manure. snow, rain. This is a country where you tested a cowboy boot to what it was really supposed to be designed for. Michael Dyke makes custom boots for cowboys in Valentine. I can usually tell when he comes in the door if he's a ranch cowboy or a wannabe. Uh, a wannabe's not as hard on him, but if he, if he likes his boots, he likes his boots, you know. So we go from there and kangaroo's good leather. I love to work with kangaroo, it's thin comes in 25, 30 colors, uh, makes a nice dress boot. I really like working with kangaroo. Now the unique pattern of the American cowboy boot has become more a symbol than a matter of utility. Not just a fashion statement, but a cultural declaration. 
Comfort in the saddle or on the ground is not the question. These boots are identification badges, just as surely as an ambassador's pinstripe suit, a judge's robes, or a farmer's bib overalls. When you live on the plains, you learn an ethnology of clothing. In one place you wear one thing, in another place you wear another. In the city, you wouldn't think of wearing your hat while you're eating supper in a nice restaurant. Out here, you wouldn't dream of asking anyone to take his off. I suspect in New York City there are places you can't get served if you're wearing jeans. In Valentine, Nebraska, cattle country, you might get in trouble for wearing a tie. There are places you wear Nikes and patent leather loafers. There are places you wear cowboy boots. Up next on Postcards from Nebraska. The first line of defense these days is not a bunch of six-gun toting cowboys or a posse bent on lynching. These days, no matter what the weather, the law appears in the unprepossessing form of Donna Wagner, brand inspector. We check for their brands. Uh, a lot of times it's no brands. We go by other marks. And that's our job to make sure that, that everything is a legitimate deal. I know it sounds like something out of the Old West, but we still have trouble with cattle rustling out here on the Nebraska Plains. A lot of trouble. Cattle have been stolen from their pastures just a few miles from my place at Danabrog. The first line of defense these days is not a bunch of six-gun toting cowboys or a posse bent on lynching. These days, no matter what the weather, the law appears in the unprepossessing form of Donna Wagner, brand inspector. We check for their brands. Uh, a lot of times it's no brands. We go by other marks. And that's our job to make sure that, that everything is a legitimate deal. A lot of Donna's work concerns checking cattle before they're sold at auction. Like this one at Kearney, Nebraska. We get reports all the time on, uh, you know, cattle missing, and uh, we look for them when they come through the sale barns, or we look, you know, like somebody ends up with something they shouldn't, or whatever, you know, and it takes a lot of investigation and, and whatnot to, to keep everything straight around here. It's hard to figure out which ones is which, unless they leave a little tail on them. Yeah, leave a tail on them. These guys may look like old-time cowboys, and in many ways they are, but they also use the most modern technology to help them with their jobs and to stop rustlers. Problem is, the bad guys use the same stuff. All you have to do to steal livestock is spot the cattle near a road, back up a big truck, and get out of there as fast as you can. Do you have anything like a 10 most wanted list of people that you'd really like to get a hold of? Well, no, a lot of this, you know, sometimes it might take, you know, a year or so under investigation, you know, you just kind of keep an eye on certain people and and uh, that you suspect. The vast distances out here and the immense amount of land under the supervision of just a few cowboys and ranchers makes close watch over these herds almost impossible. Moreover, the plague of lawlessness in America may finally be reaching deep into the grasslands. Whatever the circumstances, cattle can be worth $1,000 a head and are prime targets for the larcenous. They're like somebody that doesn't have cattle or their own and all of a sudden they've got 10 or 12 calves out there. You, you know, you think, well, did they buy them or have we just kind of walked into my yard, you know? All those thing. cows having all those twins and triplets yeah. out there. Yeah. <laughs> Brands, clear and indelible marks of ownership, 
provide Donna Wagner the best system for keeping track of whose cattle are whose. Now, in this kind of weather, it's got to be kind of tough to spot brands on yeah. those animals. Yeah, when they get wet like that, it's harder to, to read them. Do you have to go to school to learn how to do this? No, it's kind of on the, on the job training. Um, the more you look at, the better you get. Um, I suppose talk to old timers and learn what they know. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's it's I basically wrote up quite a few spring, violations you know, just in my area. I receive phone calls now where I wasn't before. You know, they they know I'm watching anyways. Sometimes brands simply help sort out contrary-minded cattle that strayed from one pasture to another. I've had stray animals drift onto my place, and when I call the sheriff and tell him what I could see by way of a brand, with help of the brand inspector, they can usually find the rightful owner at once. On the other hand, if those cattle are stolen, the thief better be smarter than to try to unload them in Donna Wagner's inspection area. The crime may be an old one and a persistent one, but in the region of South Central Nebraska covered by Donna, her presence constitutes fair warning. Not here, buddy. Not here. When postcards from Nebraska returns. Harvest is realization, a relief that however bad things have been for the crops, whatever's in the bins, it is in the bins. The very nature of the plains seems to be too much. Too much of everything. Too much heat, too much cold, too much rain, not enough rain. Too much snow, too little snow. And that's the way it seems to be with agriculture too. There's either not enough water or there's too much water. Not enough chemicals, too many chemicals. Not enough harvest, too much harvest. Harvest, after all, is what farming's about. The farmer plants, cultivates, irrigates, works all summer long with an eye toward harvest. For a week now, it's been cool and dry. Perfect weather for harvest. But today it looks like rain. Will it rain? Well, you can't take a chance. The moisture in the grain is just right. The temperature's right. So before the rain, before the snow, before the wind, it's time for harvest. And when it's time for harvest, there's time for nothing but harvest. The highways around Dannebrog become clogged with what I think of as moon machines. If extraterrestrials ever wanted to invade North America, all they'd need to do is come in vehicles that look like this. Are these weapons or agricultural equipment? Don't ask me. I don't know. And yet, despite all that, fall is my favorite time of the year on the plains. For one thing, it means that the withering heat of summer is past, and those of us who've lived on the plains for any period of time have managed to forget that winter is just around the corner. Perhaps what I like best of all about fall is the modest victory that harvest represents. It means that despite the bugs, the wind, the hail, drought, flood, and fire, 
that something is being harvested. And it's always better than nothing. Harvest is realization. A relief that however bad things have been for the crops, whatever's in the bins, it is in the bins. Suddenly, where there was no need for any rail cars at all, we must have tens of thousands of rail cars right now. For soybeans, milo, corn, wheat, hay, all of the things that grow here. Where only a few weeks ago there was concern that there might be no harvest this year, there are mountains of grain piled on the ground waiting for rail cars. Farmers who only a few weeks ago were praying for rain to grow this grain now have to pray that no rain falls to spoil it. Autumn on the plains is a season when the farmer looks at the calendar, but never the clock. Well into the night, the lights of the huge machines bob and sway across the fields. The labor of harvest doesn't stop simply because it's dark. At night, the fields are filled with the dust of the invasion and wavering, glaring lights by which the battle is fought. All night, all day, massive machines prowl the landscape, proceeding with mysterious processes that only a small fraction of America's population understands. A mere 2% of Americans are farmers. 200 years ago, when this country was founded, the figures were precisely reversed. Only 2% of Americans were not farmers. Agriculture, a fancy word for making food, is still the main industry of America's prairies and plains. While the farmers of the heartland are preoccupied with harvest, even those of us who are farmers only at heart and make our living in the seasonless fields of the word processor resonate with what's going on around us. You can't avoid it. Still to come on Postcards from Nebraska. The country roads are rutted and the streets in Dannebrog haven't been clear of ice for months. Here in town, there's hardly any more space to pile snow and some of the piles have become landmarks. Everyone's ready for spring. I've heard there are fireplace fires in the Appalachians that are more than a century old, older than any other member of the family. I built this fire in our Dannebrog home in early December, two weeks before winter officially began, according to the calendar. Every morning now, for more than three months, I've taken out its ashes, fed it new wood. This fire's been with us so long, it's almost become a member of the family as did this past winter. Last year about this time, I complained about a spring blizzard that killed our lilacs and frustrated our hopes yet once again. The reason that blizzard was so unwelcome was that the winter had been so easy. It snowed hard on Halloween and then again the week after Easter. In between, it was really quite pleasant. 
We used our fireplace then as an adjunct to our heating system. I build a fire some mornings, maybe again that evening, just to take the chill off the house. That's the way it's been the past six years, since before this fireplace was built. And all this time I longed out loud for one of those cold winters of my childhood, the kind of winter when the trees snapped and popped from the sub-zero temperatures, when icicles grew all the way to the ground, when the rivers froze solid from bank to bank. Well, this was one of those winters of my youth, the kind my folks used to talk about, the kind where the river really did freeze solid from bank to bank. This winter I worried as the woodpile grew ever lower. I had to wrestle the tractor through the heavy snow to bring loads of wood up from the bottomlands. The white stuff blew in here when winter first began, and we haven't seen the ground since. Last fall, I loaded up a couple of old trailers with firewood, but the snow never let up enough for me to haul it up to the house. The problem was, if the ice and sleet took out our electricity again, the fireplace would have been the only thing between us in here and the winter out there. Out here, everyone likes to boast about how unpleasant the weather can be. And this winter gave us our share of problems. The country roads are rutted and the streets in Danabrog haven't been clear of ice for months. Here in town, there's hardly any more space to pile snow. And some of the piles have become landmarks. Everyone's ready for spring. I am too, but I'll have to admit that when I finally bank this fire for the last time some evening soon, and the next morning enjoy my coffee without bothering to build it up again, I'm going to feel just a little bit sorry too. It's been a good fire, this winter's fire, and a good friend too.